Ciao, I'm Pushkar Brand. In this video, I'm going to show you my approach to circuit bending, my molding a video device I've never bent before. It will not be a short video because there are many issues that have to be addressed in the order. The most important, precautions and disclaimers, tool needed, analysis of the circuit, safe poking, analysis of the enclosure, drilling and installation of the components, CV input. I have just released my latest album, Steel Mortal. Check the link in the description to give it a listen. The obvious things are not only the most important, but also the most misunderstood. Most video devices are wall powered. This means that bending these devices implies a concrete risk of electronic shock and death. The risk can be drastically lowered by taking the right precautions. But circuit bending wall powered devices remains an intrinsically dangerous practice that requires a lot of attention, concentration and knowledge to be practiced safely. Obviously, however long this video may be, it will not give you the skills and knowledge needed to circuit bend safely. Not only the advice I will give in this video will not guarantee total safety, but it will also be useful only for those people who are already familiar with circuit bending and electronics. Therefore, if you have never bent battery-powered devices, watch this video, hopefully you will learn something, but don't end your career of bender before it starts. Start bending battery-powered devices, make your mistakes, achieve your results, learn, experiment, get familiar with the process. Once you feel confident enough, once your confidence is actually grounded in some effective skills and knowledge, you may start to think about bending a wall-powered video device. Be sure you know what you're doing, be focused on what you're doing, and follow all the possible precautions, including never bending wall-powered devices. I do not have a background in electronics, and I will talk about my personal approach to circuit bending. Which tools do we need? A video processor, an answer mixer or whatever device with a video output, a CRT, composite AV cables, SCART converters, soldering iron, solder wire, wires between 26 and 32 AWG, variable resistances, switches, push buttons, ceramic capacitors, pliers, tweezers, wire cutter, drill, thin bread point drill bit, step cone drill bit, wrap paper, heat shrinks for mistakes, mini jack sockets, photoresistors, lead, maxi heat shrinks. The first thing to do is to look at the circuit and uh, starting by where's the, where you can find the electricity. So right here, right here, there's a place you want absolutely to avoid despite this point here, which uh, will be needed to switch on uh, the device. And what else? I mean, we have two big boards as it, as it stands. There is another board on the back of this one, but since it's connected to the front of the device, it uh, will probably have to do with the controls. So we will not uh, probably need to circuit band that. And uh, what else we have here? 
we have a big board here, another big board here, and here we have the connections for the input and output. I'm using here a smart composite converter because I generally use composite uh, signals. And uh, so this is the source, so the input, and this is the output. It will be very useful to start with these points, uh, SCART points, because they have a lot of very interesting uh, pins. And so this is generally a place from which I start to explore. But by the way, we should check what else we have here. Important thing is to give a look to the chips. I mean, uh, everything here is potentially interesting. I surely avoid all uh, the el el electrolytic capacitors. Are they called uh, electrolytic? I guess so. By the way, these big towers here and uh, also the smaller one. Um, but I generally focus on chips. Also, resistances are interesting, but uh, with these very complicated circuits, uh, it's quite difficult to understand what are the safe resistances to touch because most of the time they can be, sometimes they can be connected to something that is potentially dangerous. So, strategically, I focus on the chips I have on the good ports. If I can, I try to look for a manual on um, on internet, and if I can't, I try to look for the name of the chips and look for them in Google so that I can find the data sheet of the chip. The most important thing to do is to underline the points in which you have the ground and uh, um, electricity connection, VDD. Those points must be avoided. So, for what regards this uh, video processor, uh, I've been quite lucky since there's a manual online that uh, has a lot of information about it. So, uh, the, in this manual, uh, for sure, I can start by looking at the main boards and trying to see what, uh, what's their purpose. So, looking at it, I can uh, recognize them by the shape. This one here is the color management board, while the other one is the input output, output switching board. I'm quite sure I will find a lot of interesting things uh, here in the color management board. And uh, there are also more detailed uh, information about the PCB, about the connection between the points. But uh, I am mostly interested in the information about the ICs, the chips. So, for example, here I have a EU4066B, which is this chip here. And here I can see that this point, the number, the pin number 14 and the pin number 7, are a VSS and VDD pins. And I want to avoid them because they most likely bring electricity and I don't want to touch them. So, all these points are fine. There is also this other chip here with the same information about the points. Generally, it, it, it is quite common that the VSS and VDD point are at the corner of the top right and bottom left corners of the chip. But this is only a general rule. I mean, it's not even a rule, it's a, it is simply very common. But sometimes they are also in other places. In I like this one, for example. This one is the top left and the bottom left. So I have to sign all these points on my chip. There are also other resources that can help me um, in this regard, like chip find data sheet archive. Here I can type the uh, name of the code 
the chip and plug in. Find it like this one, for example. Here I can download the data sheet and I can find the information I need. I am not interested in uh, what this chip does. I'm not really interested in checking what these things uh, do. I mean, it would be nice to know them, but uh, uh, I don't have a specific knowledge of uh, electronics. I, I mean, I understand some bits here and there, but the thing is that I don't know why the glitch is resulting that way. So I'm only looking for the points I don't want to touch. So this is the first thing I do when I start uh, circuit bending a device. It, I'm trying to analyze the uh, board and the components as much as I can by using the uh, manual of the device or a website that uh, help me finding the data sheet of the components. So I've checked every single chip I found and I've signed all the VCC and VDD points and as you can see I have signed in yellow in yellow because uh, my the red is finished I've signed all the points that I don't want to touch see here I was a bit uncertain because the schematic wasn't clear but um, a big yellow sign are the most potentially dangerous so I will not touch them. The next thing I do uh, is uh, making a scheme of the of the two bores as you can see more or less these uh, two draws resemble the schematics. Uh, I report the chips like as they are in a way that I can find them easily and uh, I will use this uh, this page to sign all the good connection I find uh, so let's say if I see that the um, point uh, the third uh, pin on the right of the chip number 10 uh, works well with the chip number 2 uh, on the bottom of the chip uh, 11 of the board B I write uh, a uh, 10 to right to B 11 uh, well, what was it 3 down and I write all the connection I find so let's start explore the circuit Okay, so the first thing I wanna I usually do is that I check for the uh, video input pin. In this case, we have a, a SCART uh, input, so can be useful to check for a pin breakout uh, of the SCART pins. So uh, I know that uh, this is the uh, input pin. Right, and I connect it uh, with an alligator clip. So I now take a, I generally take a potentiometer. In this case, I will start with a 10K pot. I will use the central pin and the right one. Okay. And I generally start by connecting the other alligator clip to the video output, in this case to the video output uh, pin uh, of the SCART uh, um, converter. So, to this guy here. And let's see what happens. If I open the, the pot, they generally work only in the last range of the, of the pot. I can see a very cool effects here, but it gets lost uh, in some glitch, some more radical stuff at the end. Some people can like this stuff, but it's not exactly the way in which I, I tend to bend the, the devices because uh, I can uh, obtain uh, these wilder glitches uh, by 
combining different effects I will show you later. So what I do in this case is uh, uh, when I have these like a kind of uh, mad glitches, I generally try to connect these uh, two pins by using a ceramic capacitor. In this case, I will start with a 100 nano Faraday capacitor. So I can connect it both to the, uh, in this case, yellow alligator clip or uh, green one, it doesn't matter. So it's the same. So in this case, we connect it to the green one. And then I will connect the leg of the ceramic uh, capacitor to the, uh, to the pin of the video output in this case. And uh, let's see what happens. Okay, so as you can see, the glitch here uh, looks a bit more defined, and at the end, it's, it reaches this kind of uh, stroboscopic slash uh, lit scan effect, which I like it, but I want to experiment with different uh, capacitors. So let's go with a 10 nanofaraday capacitor and let's see what happens all right now it's cooler it looks like a bit more a bit more defined and it reaches this uh, blue screen uh, at the end which is better than the other one a bit less radical it maintains uh, everything i like about the glitch and it is more manageable at the end so I will try anyway with a different cup this time with a 680 pico faraday capacitor so which are much which are with a smaller value I generally start with the higher value and then I go down in experimenting with the capacitors so let's see what happens this time okay cool more or less the same as uh, with 10 nanofaraday. So, at this point I have found my first glitch. What I do is I keep note of this glitch, of this lucky combination by, uh, let's wait a second because I don't have the agenda with me. It's taking note of the combination I found. So I will write um, the in, so video input to the out. I've used a five, five uh, it was a 50 or a 10, how much was it? It is a 10K pot, which is decent. So for this work, so I will note it, 10K. I, will, I, I liked the way that there are, that there are uh, different grades of glitches. So I will uh, sh for surely use a potentiometer, there is not an uh, on-off effect in the glitch. So in, in that case, I would have used a switch. So I will use a pot and maybe since I like the, the effect of the, of the final part of the range of the pot, I will maybe make a push button that makes this effect, which is quite cool. Now I've seen that both uh, these points, so the video input and video output, uh, can work uh, as uh, glitches uh, if connected to, to other points. So in this case I will start by using again the video input and I will start to connect it to the, all the viable points on the ICs and see what happens. So let's check. All right. The yellow alligator is already connected to the video input pin. So let's start on this side. Okay, so here I have two points that I cannot touch the first two pins on the top left. So I go with the third point. Let's see if something happens. Oh, yeah, something. It's not so drastic, it goes black screen, so maybe I could check with a capacitor. Let's try with a 47 nanofaraday capacitor. 
And let's see if something changes. All right. Mm. There is this stroboscopic, stroboscopic uh, stuff uh, and the video became grey. Well, nah, not so good. Let's try with a one nanofaraday and see if something changes. No, it's too low the value. As you can see, there is no, there are no glitches anymore. That happens when the value of the capacitor is too low. So let's try maybe with a 0.7 nano Faraday, and then see if it works. No, there is this again. This same kind of blur effect. So no good for the the, the third point is not good. The third on the top. Let's try with the fourth. Now, five. Oh, here something happens on the fifth point. Was it the fifth or was it the sixth? Oh, it's the sixth. All right. Oh, cool. All right. Let's try also with the seventh. Here we have something strange. It happens only at the first time I touch the point. All right, okay, so let's try with the cup. Let's see what happens. I'll take a 10 nanofaraday cup. All right, let's see if, it's, if we are more lucky. Hmm. I have this kind of blur effect on the fifth pin. In the sixth, nothing happens. On the seventh, mm -hmm. everything became of the same color of the background. It could be cooler, but I'm sure this device reserves better surprises than this stuff. All right, so this was a 10 nanofaraday. Let's go with a 100 nanofaraday. I said before I generally start with a higher value, then I don't respect what I say, and this is what happens. Oh, third, I don't like it. Yeah, no, there is this uh, kind of distortion, which is cool, but not thing special. Again, stroboscopy with the fifth, sixth, nothing great, and here. Mm. This could be promising, but uh, maybe I should try with a little bit uh, lower value, like 47 nanofaraday. Let's see. Last attempt for the for the top row of this pin. Mm. Nothing good. All right. So let's go with the next one. So with the same chip, but the bottom row. All right, so the first point. Mm. Nice, but not in gray. There is again this effect. It looks like that this border is dealing with the... Oh, there was something nice here. Wait, this horizontal distortion on the second pin. Let's see the third. Nothing. Fourth. Ah. Cool. The fourth point is nice. The fifth as well, but it goes wild. The sixth, mm, bit less. And the last one is similar to the previous one. Okay, so in all these cases, as you can see, the um, glitch could be promising, but uh, is a bit wild. I generally tame these wilder effects by using a cap, and most of the time it works. Now something good will come out, I hope. Let's see with the first pin with a 100 cap. It remains the same, the second one. Ah, 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 ah. I have unlocked something. But I'm sure that with a lower... Okay, so 100 is too high. Let's try with a 10. 10 nanofaraday. Again, with the first pin. It remains as it was. The second one. 
Ah, the distortion is a bit more uh, stable, but nothing. Maybe we still need uh, something lower. The third one is the same. Fourth, nothing. Fifth, nothing. Sixth, nothing. And A again. No, so I will try with a lower one for the first three pins and with a, a higher one for the last three. Okay, so the first one. Hmm. Okay, this could be nice. With a 680 Pico Faraday. Cup. I have unlocked something that could it could be interesting, nothing special, but here what we have again here we have great distortions. Maybe we can go even further and going with a 220 Pico Faraday and let's see what happens with these pins. Because in generally I am more lucky with the higher values uh, caps but in this case it looks like lower caps could be better nothing here uh, nothing here now maybe this chip it's not worth it last attempt with a 37 nano faraday on the last Row here, web strobe, web I don't know if I should keep this one. It looks cool, uh, but I'm sure there is better. All right, so the chip thin has nothing special. Let's go with the 16. In my note, I'm starting from down here. It's the same, whatever you start. Okay, again, weird stuff. Okay, cool. The third one is nice. The fifth one as well. Sixth, seventh, and last one. All right, it looks kind of similar to the previous, to the chip number 15. Horizontal distortions and those kind of weird stuff. Let's see if we will be more lucky. The capacitor cells start with a 100 nanofaraday cap. Ah. Here the background became transparent. Here this kind of stuff. Nothing special, nothing special, nothing special. Strobe, strobe, no, and no. Nothing special here again. Let's go with the 17. It looks kind of similar to the previous two chips. This one is cool though. But uh, it's not my cup of tea. Okay, it goes black. No, no. Okay. Okay, no, they look like the the previous chips, so I will just make an attempt with a 10 nano faraday cap, just to see if I'm missing something. Hey, here there is something. As you can see, there is a cool, even if table, uh, feedback effect. 
Here in these cases, if D it is fable, there's a chance that the capacitor is too low. So in this case, I will try to use a cup with a higher value. So instead of a, a, a pot of a 10k, I will use a 100k pot. So let's go with the pin number 2 of the top row of the chip number 17. Let's see what happens. Uh, okay, it remains fable. All right, so probably it is the fault uh, is of the capacitor, which is uh, probably too low. Let's try with a 47 instead of a 10 nanofaraday. All right. I should switch to a 10 K pot. Come back to it. And let's see. Okay. Now it is a bit more, it's a bit stronger, but uh, we will probably be more lucky with a 100 nanofaraday cup. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, it's more or less the same. By the way, I like this. So, oh, I forgot here to write the, the value of the cup of the previous glitch. Then I'll go with, uh, again, video input. Uh, the number of the chip was uh, A17. Uh, two. Up. Second, uh, chi uh, second pin of the top row. With a, it, a and a K. Uh, probably here I'm wrong, because uh, as, a, as a, you have seen, the uh, effect didn't have a lot of intermediate position. And even at the end it was uh, quite... Uh, um, light. So in this case I will probably go with a switch because I only need the on-off um, effect, not the intermediate uh, positions. So in this case I will uh, install a switch with a 47 nano Faraday cup. And this is the second glitch I will install, probably. Let's proceed! I was at the pin number two. Let's go with the pin number three. The, again, the strobe effect for uh, nothing special. Oh, 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 oh. All right, here we are. As you can see, now I'm trying. I'm moving very, very slowly the pot at the end. And I have a very, very narrow, I'll try to show you better, uh, where was it? Okay, I have a very, very narrow area in which the positions are good. So in this case, it means that the, the potentiometer is value is too high. So I will switch from a 10K to a I will try with uh, directly with a 1K. Pot. So, let's try again. No, it's on this one. It's the fault. Uh, no, not the fault, the fifth. Oh yeah, here we are. Oh no, okay. Now with the 1K pot, I have a bit more of a play with the positions. The effect is cool. If I go too high, it goes crazy. So maybe uh, now I'm with a 100 nanofaraday cap, which is maybe too high. So let's try with a 47. Let's see if it is uh, more stable. 
Oh, no. Okay, yes. As you can see now, it doesn't go anymore to that uh, weird area in which it freezes and stuff like that. So, I like a lot this one. It's cool. So, it is the point. So, again. Video input. A17 5 up, like the chip number 17, looks nice. 1K pot, probably also a push. By the way, the push uh, uh, works uh, as a switch, is a momentary on off. So if I like the final range or if I like the effect, this is the way in which I choose. I pick up my push buttons. Um, I um, choose to install also push buttons for this specific glitch. So in this case, it was a 1K uh, pot with uh, a, oops, I don't remember, what was it? With a well, 47 nano Faraday. All right, let's proceed. Here, after a couple of hours of exploration of the circuit, I came up with this uh, list of uh, bands. And uh, as you can see, most of them are connected to the video input. And uh, I have uh, found 13 good connections for uh, potentiometers, four connections for the switches, and eight connections for the push button. So generally, um, I, I thought that this device uh, would have been able to support more bands, but I didn't find so many um, glitches yet, uh, considering that the available space on the device itself is quite limited. I'm happy with the, with the results because I generally uh, hate uh, excluding uh, some of the bands I've found. So in this case, I will be able to implement, uh, I think, all of the bands I've found. So the next step is preparing the um, layout, the implementation of these new components. Okay, now it's time to decide where to install the new components. As you can see here on the back of the front panel, there isn't much space. There is some space here, a bit of space here, some space here, and a bit of space here on the sides. However, Considering how the front of this device is made, you can see that it is not a good idea to install components on this side or on this side because there is like a quite thick plastic cover, while on this part here it looks like it will be more easy to install the components. So I guess I will dedicate, I will, I will use this side here and these parts here on the side. I've cut some graph paper so that I can cover all the parts in which I can install some components. Now I will attach it with some tape this one here. It is important to note that sometimes the area that looks like uh, looks good for installing components could be tricky. Like this one, this part here, seem quite free, yet we have to consider that when we will close the, uh, the device, this part here will go 
here. So even if there is some space, some points could be difficult, like this one. So we have to be sure that we will not install components on this point because it will touch this part here. On this side, it is better because oh sorry all right because here there's a gap so all the things that i will install here will have some space so now i will uh, attach this graph paper with some tape and i will start to decide how to install the components i've tried to be extra careful in selecting the points in which I will install the components since uh, there's the chance that they uh, there will not be enough space to for them so I've, I've excluded all the, those areas in which uh, there's a chance that uh, they will touch these other parts here I've decided to Put the four switches here and the eight push buttons here. All the potentiometers will go here, and I will use these three points here to install three mini jack sockets for CV input. Okay, so the, generally uh, when I drill the uh, enclosure of these devices, I use a very, very thin bit to make the first hole, and then I use this pyramid shaped, uh, a cone pyramid shaped, something like that, uh, bit because it has these uh, steps that are prefixed and uh, are compatible with the, with the shape of the components. So just remember that you need to use the, to arrive till the second step for switches and mini jack sockets and till the third step for the potentiometers and uh, um, push buttons, at least for the kind of uh, potentiometers and push buttons I use. So let's go drilling. And here we are, decent holes, here on the side. And here. And now it's time to install the components. Components installed. Now everything is in the right place. I've already tried and uh, it can, uh, the enclosure has enough space to be closed. I also added two other uh, potentiometers for audio reactiveness. I will talk a bit about that later. And so, <sighs> This more or less the panel see the input and some switches here. Now it's time to connect all this stuff. Being the part of soldering, I think that uh, it is mostly a question of uh, habits. So 
I think that what I will say is mostly irrelevant, uh, so, and since uh, you can find uh, better information about how to solve the um, other videos you know, on YouTube here or whatever. Anyway, the first thing I do is generally soldering the capacitors. But it will be easier for me to connect the pins of the ICs to the pins of the various components. A very important thing that I learned in, in the hard way is that uh, it is important to solder with the device switched off. Uh, so every time I, I will make a solder on the board, I will switch off the device and then I will turn it on when I've done to check if the connection works, if everything works as expected and if there are any issue. It is important to check uh, on every step, on each step, so that uh, we will avoid bad surprises at the end. In this way we will be able to check if any solder is done properly, if the connections work, if uh, there was any mistake. The video input pin, this yellow, this pin right here, yes, this one, is connected to a lot of components, to the first nine potentiometers, so to all these pots, to this one, then to two switches and to four different push buttons and probably to one of these, uh, if not both, audio reactive uh, uh, pots. So the, what I will do is to put a wire here, connect it to the first one, to the closest one, and then connect it to this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, so that I it will be easier to spread that pin around all the, all the parts I need. And here we are. Now I will do the same thing for all the other points following the schematics I made. So I will have to solder for, I think, uh, four hours, something like that. And now, as last thing, let's make a back troll. We will need three LED. I use a white LED, a photo resistor, a resistance, I use a 180 ohm, a thick heat shrink, and that's it. And also these tools that are always useful. So we start by, this is obviously my technique, I'm sure there's plenty of better techniques, but this is what I do. So I take the positive leg, the leg of the LED, bend another positive leg, and I start to twist them all right, like that. Then I add the resistor. Oops. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I add the third leg 
here I put these two in this way, the third one in this way, and I twist the leg all right. Okay. So now I will solder these three legs. Right. Now I can cut all the legs, all the pins, the legs. Okay. We should end up with something like this. So all the three positive legs of the L LED connected to the resistance. Now, next step is to connect, intertwin the three negative legs. We have to be sure that the positive and negative leg don't touch each other. So we have to make some adjustments. And then we can solder them again. Let's solder the negative legs. All right. Okay. And now let's cut two legs and let's keep only one. All right, in this way we have a super LED which is made with three different LEDs that have only one input and one output. The important thing, the tricky bit, is to keep the positive and negative legs divided because if they touch each other that it will not work. At this point, we have to open the heat shrink, put the new big LED we just made inside. Let's keep out the both legs of at least one centimeter. And then let's take the Photo resistor. Let's bend it in this way and then let's make this kind of a shape, something like this. Now we can insert this cell inside the back troller or the forthcoming battery. At this point, we need the lighter. Let's start heat on the side of the photoresistor first. Let's be sure that the legs don't bend on each other as it's happening now. If it happens, what you can do is bending them again. So let's see them again, and then we can squeeze the back troll. Let's go on the other side. Ah. 
the resistance came out a bit, but it should still work. All right. Okay. Generally, don't leave the resistance out, but it can be useful to remember what is the positive side. Here we are, a back troll. In this way, we can make as many CV controls as we want. The important is to connect the positive to the uh, positive input on the mini jack socket and the negative to the negative input while connecting the other two points of the photoresistance resistance to any other band we want. So, free CV input, semi-free, very cheap. And Vactrol installed. As you can see, I've added extra layers of heat shrinks to keep the uh, soldering points covered. And then I've connected the red wire to the positive input of the mini jacket and uh, of the mini jack socket, the black wire to the ground. The, remember the red wire was the one connected to the resistance to the longer leg and now it's done it's time to close it you can see the back troll is working this is the first one the fact I've chosen this is the second one and this is the third one. The Sansui has been bent. Show you briefly a couple of glitches and how the CV input work just to give you a bit uh, and a small insight in what uh, this guy can do. So here we are, this effect. Here we have this one here. If we combine the, we get something like that. Oh, yeah. As you can see by 
combining different knobs we reach different territories. Uh, the glitch are displayed depends a lot from the kind of television you use. In this moment I cannot show you what happens on my other screens but the, the, the results vary a lot. I've noticed that these uh, Sony Trimitron Wega that I'm using now works very well with this machine, so I'm recording that one. start uh, connecting one of the CV input uh. at the moment I have uh, three different uh, ramps coming from my intelligent quadra start using the first one And that's it. 